Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this first session uh, of the ZNUFA workshop. Um, it's really my pleasure to invite and introduce uh, Tara Julia Hamilton uh, to give the first lecture of the, of the workshop. Tara is, first of all, a friend and then a brilliant scientist, and uh, she's now working as associate professor of the School of Electrical and Data Engineering at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, she did a lot of things, and I think that what is relevant is that in her education, there's both, you know, engineering, but also um, uh, economics and marketing. And uh, I think this is very important to create research that has really an impact in our lives. And in fact, she has been working both in academia and uh, in industry and technology-oriented industry uh, to create devices uh, for mainly for health and biomedical applications. So relevant to this workshop, she, she worked in microelectronics and um, neuromorphic engineering to develop devices that using spike neural network and learning can impact in biomedical applications and auditory systems mostly. So, uh, Tara, the stage is yours. I'm really looking forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Kiara. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here, um, all the way from uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about unsupervised spiking neural networks uh, that I've basically, that, that's sort of the main type of spiking neural network that I've been working on for a number of years. Um, but, you know, it's full of challenges. So mostly I'll talk to you about challenges today and hopefully that will inspire some discussions and things. So um, let me go on. So firstly, just a little bit about me. Here I kind of covered a, a lot of it. I, I started my life as an analog integrated circuit designer. Um, and my first job was actually at Cochlear that make the, uh, the cochlear implants. And that sort of led to being interested in biology and things and then got interested in neuromorphic engineering. So I've been doing neuromorphic engineering since 2004. And I started work with silicon cochleas um, and then silicon neurons. And both of those two things sort of uh, pose challenges as a circuit designer, um, mainly because of the nonlinear dynamics. Um, it's sort of something that as straight circuit designer isn't used to these circuits that behave weirdly in particular. Um, operating regimes. Um, I've probably, I tried to work this out, but it's probably been uh, since 2009 that I've been looking at spiking neural networks. Um, and we started looking at sort of uh, extreme learning machine type networks uh, with spikes. And then I uh, got more interested in unsupervised networks and, and how we can do kind of unsupervised learning. Um, I've been kind of keeping a low profile because I had some twins and that's kind of kept me busy, kept my hands full. Um, but now I'm looking at uh, edge computing and sensors and looking at incorporating uh, learning at, at the edge. So spiking networks are really great um, for, for that application. Um, so, um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, unsupervised spiking neural networks. Firstly, why? Why are they interesting? Um, and then I'm going to be talking about two different types of networks that I've been playing with. So firstly, the Franken rhythms, um, and I'll explain what that is later. And secondly, principled spiking neural networks, where we really uh, sort of dive in and uh, hope to, to use... Um, principles of, of neuroscience to make our networks and then sort of uh, what what happens next um, type thing. So why spike in neural networks are probably preaching to the converted here, but um, there is something very, uh, I, I don't know, like it's, it's hard to look at biology, any biology, a simple insect all the way up to, to complex life and not be kind of wowed by that and the capabilities in terms of computation that comes with that. Um, as I said before, one of the real reasons for me as a sort of hardware engineer person is, is looking at edge computing and looking at building sensor networks and sensors that have the ability to learn 
um, at the sensor. Um, we're kind of living in this world of lots of data um, and the traditional machine learning methods require data to be labeled, um, someone to kind of process it, the pre-processing of the data, um, and it makes it very inefficient on so many levels. So a more biological approach, I think, is, is definitely the way we need to go. Um, there's also, like, from, a, from an engineering point of view, a lot of security to be had from encoding and computation in spikes because it's really hard to work backwards and work out what it's what all that data is so it does have a nice sort of inherent security aspect um, there's obviously if you're using sparse um, spiking networks low power is a huge um, issue and then as i said before um, being able to deal with data that's not labeled um, and, and trying to sift through that without the extra overhead, I think is a challenge that we all need to get our heads around. So why unsupervised? Um, it's kind of my, uh, my big nightmare. Um, my PhD was looking at a, a nonlinear um, model of the cochlea and the cochlea is sort of poised on a bifurcation. So, it gets this amazing um, gain and compressive effect from being a nonlinear system. But building that thing and having so many things to tune, as I just have nightmares about lots of turning lots of knobs. So um, unsupervised learning, ways to kind of self-organize um, you know, networks and circuits without having to twist all the knobs is, is what I, I aim for in my life. Um, it's basically some sort of traumatic experience that I, I just, I need to get the, uh, the uh, <laughs> I, I need to get rid of all the knobs. So that's, that's the main reason. I kind of look at standard machine learning. I feel very sorry for everyone having to tune parameters. And so I've kind of made it my life, uh, my life's mission to avoid parameter tuning um, at all costs. So um, Franken rhythms. Um, this is a term that a colleague of mine has uh, coined and I sort of run with it because uh, it sort of explains what was well, certainly what I did earlier and, and what I still kind of do now. So we all know that getting the biology right is really hard. Um, it's hard because we don't have all the answers yet. We're still finding out things about the brain. Um, and it's hard because we've got sort of von Neumann computers that uh, when we're dealing with large, heavily connected networks, we're really limited. Um, but we've also got these hardware advantages with really cheap um, reconfigurable hardware that runs at lightning speed. And so sometimes it's hard to justify working on a slow spiking network um, that you're not really sure whether it's going to work very well or it's not going to work to the same level as a deep network. Um, and so, yeah, when you're trying to work out what network to use and, and what's going to be the best for your solution, it's sometimes hard to go with the straight principled spiking network, certainly at this point as we still sift through how to make those things work. Um, so the Franken rhythms are really biologically inspired but they're really about tailoring solutions um, that will benefit a particular application um, and it's great for applications where i can't just put a deep network on an fpga and let it run in the wild um, it's not going to work um, so it's this nice sort of balance between the two so early work on franken rhythms um, was with my students saeed and richard um, and we designed the scan algorithm, which is this, this sort of uh, fun algorithm that was designed very much for hardware, digital hardware, and was able to learn timing between spikes. So if you encode your data as spikes, then you could learn the timing between spikes. Um, and it, it used sort of an adaptive threshold um, method where you basically can think of you start off with a wide um, receptive field, 
Um, and as you get more presentations of the, um, the, the spike interval that you're interested in, um, the network tunes itself closer and closer to learning that particular um, spike interval. And you have a larger network of these and you use inhibition once somebody's caught a, a uh, spike time, then the, that neuron has that time and you can have a bunch of neurons and learn different times. And this, this um, you know, it, it worked quite well um, for particular applications, um, completely unsupervised, which was really nice and really easy to implement on FPGA hardware. And it, it used sort of biological principles in terms of having uh, weights, having um, an adaptive threshold and using inhibition to allow multiple neurons to learn. Um, some of the problems it, it had, though, was that uh, timing was difficult. If you had a stream of uh, inputs coming in too fast, you'd either have to drop them or the whole thing would sort of fall over. Um, and it didn't really scale very well. Um, it was good for sort of a first pass on data, but then having subsequent layers, we ran into a lot of the problems that other spiking neural networks run into that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so, yeah, so this has been adapted further, um, but, you know, it has problems. But it, it, it was good for what it did. Um, so it was really easy to set up a simple... Uh, this in, in the paper that we did, uh, learning different hand signs. Um, it was easy, very simple, low power FPGA, completely unsupervised. Anyone could get in front of it and the network would train on them. And the interesting thing about it was that even though it was really dead easy, um, it, it had this, these Bayesian inference properties. So it actually... Um, it, it, it had this, uh, you know, early receptive field that grew to collect um, the, the second spike and then um, zoomed in around that. So it was, it was really, um, it was really kind of fell out of, of the um, network rather than being um, designed into it, which was kind of an interesting uh, concept. So um, just on the Franken rhythms, um, the idea is really just starting with an application. So what do you need an unsupervised network for? Um, if it's a well-bounded problem, like the problem that I've been looking at now, which is uh, cardiac monitoring, um, it's bounded well in time. There's a, a minimum heart rate that a person can have and a maximum before they're dead either way. Um, and so you kind of know what what your signals are going to look like. Um, and that helps you then tailor a network around it. Um, and then in an application like cardiac monitoring, um, requiring low power um, and thinking about where the application is going to be used. Um, we've been working with collaborators in India and looking at rural areas and, um, you know, compliance and infrastructure uh, availability and all that needs to be kind of built in to your design. And then um, for health monitoring, making it so that it's personalized and secure are, are really important aspects. So I just see that there's some discussion over, um, over uh, the uh, security aspects. I can't read that now, but um, I guess, uh, yeah, we can debate uh, whether it actually is more secure or not. But uh, as a first pass, it probably is slightly more secure than a numerical um, encoding. Um, so for our solution here, we're trying to build a, a wearable cardiac monitor that uh, people can, uh, that has a long life battery life um, that people in remote areas can, can use for their cardiac health. Um, and so on that, we kind of want to build a system that learns the individual person and compares their normal with any um, anomalies from, from that normal reading. So the network is comprised of a neuromorphic ADC, which is basically doing the feature extraction. So we use populations of neurons with 
around different thresholds so that we can catch different features in a uh, QRS complex of a cardiac signal. Um, and these neurons are sort of standard integrating fire neurons um, with some threshold adaptation. Um, and this also reduces the need for pre-processing. So um, when we have large populations of neurons, we can actually use them to, uh, where they correlate, we can use them to remove um, constant noise. So here, a 50 hertz um, noise is present in a, in a signal. Um, and we can use neurons uh, to um, uh, transform that signal into spikes and then correlations between those uh, spikes. We can then subtract that from our signal and find um, very small signals inside that. So we're just using populations, basically. Lots of numbers, lots of numbers that are spread out um, to, to give us a a, a good way of, of getting rid of uh, constant noise, which is what we often have in um, in, in uh, medical devices. So, um, so yeah, so th this sort of solution is looking at using a kind of stochastic approach to analog to digital conversion or analog to spike conversion. Um, and it then also has the added benefit of giving us different features um, of, of, the, of the ECG signal. And then we have a learning network, which is not too dissimilar from SCAN, except it's not handicapped by the timing issues I discussed. And this basically, we once we receive a spike on one channel, uh, we have a sort of decaying, a linear decay weight. Uh, when the next spike comes in, we kind of learn what those addition of those two spikes are, and then we set the threshold. So we we end up learning sort of a, a tight ring around our spike times. Um, and well, the ring can be tied or loose. So um, a person's normal ECG, it varies across the course of a day. Um, so you might have several channels that learn, you know, when you're resting or when you're uh, running or uh, when you're watching a scary movie or something. Um, and then other channels that can pick up very quickly if there's an anomaly. So this is an ECG. I was trying to get the balance right. It's hard to zoom in on an ECG and also show the larger detail. But this is an ECG with ST elevation. Um, and one of the channels picks up very quickly that there's some sort of anomaly on this. And this could then alert a health professional or something like that. So the Franken rhythms are these sort of mashed up spiking networks that are quite useful for specific tasks. And it has elements of biological um, neurons, but it also is very much tailored to particular applications. So this we can put on a very low cost F FPGA um, because of the, the neuro neuromorphic ADC um, taking features and the kind of stochastic population coding that we're using, we can reduce the amount of pre-processing we need as well. So all in all, it's a, a fairly good engineering problem for a, a solution to a, a very kind of constrained problem. So um, the other aspect of the research that I've been doing is looking at principal spiking neural networks. And this came about um, uh, having a conversation with someone at a computational neuroscience um, conference here in Australia. And um, just the frustration that we haven't got spiking neural networks sorted. Um, and it's difficult because, uh, you know, deep networks and, and uh, other types of machine learning are, are so successful right now. So it's hard to get people on board with the idea of uh, spiking networks as something that can really, um, you know, really take over or, or actually be better than, than what we currently have with conventional networks. Um, so we kind of call them stuns, um, spike timing, unsupervised neural networks. Um, we do have a little bit of an obsession with getting uh, uh, acronyms that say something. Um, but stuns are basically using spiking neurons, uh, looking at spike time coding, 
uh, and incorporating a lot of the things that we know are important ingredients, so sparsity, um, sparse spiking and sparse connectivity, um, SDDP for, for unsupervised learning, and basically an approach that is more um, aimed at looking at the principles in biology rather than you know a franken rhythms approach or uh, looking at how um, deep networks work and trying to work out how how spikes fit into that so it's it's sort of uh it's a slow approach i can certainly say that so we, we kind of started off very simply looking at auto encoding and, and anomaly detection and we actually trained on moby dick if anyone's ever read Moby Dick, it's a very long-winded book. Um, but it's an interesting thing that you can actually get pretty good auto-encoding using a spiking network with not many bells and whistles, this one. We, we didn't really, we weren't down the rabbit hole yet, um, but it was already kind of encouraging because the amount of data that you need to train a spiking network is significantly lower than for a conventional deep network. Um, and that was already apparent in this work. Um, so this is the most interesting picture from the paper. Um, but basically it's not, nothing here is surprising. So as you, as you train on more characters, um, you, your auto encoding improves, but your anomaly detection, you know, is terrible because you're basically just learning everything. Um, and and then there's a, this sweet spot where you're kind of doing pretty well um, on your auto encoding and picking up anomalies. But it's that wasn't really the most interesting part. This was a three layer network, um, STDP synapses, uh, sparse um, connectivity, um, and with some inhibition laterally um, and that's that's about it um, and that, I guess the most interesting thing was the the lack of data required to, to start getting results um, so really what we've been focusing on is <clears throat> there are some known problems with uh, spiking neural networks so there's the there's this there's the vanishing spike problem which is uh, as you move through layers in a spiking network, you lose spikes. Um, there's the issue with spikes being impulses and therefore analytically solving some sort of mathematical framework that tells you how they work is not really possible without making lots of assumptions and without having you know whiteboards full of math. Um, the lack of an objective function so knowing that your network has trained um you know there's not really an error signal in a in an unsupervised network so how do you how do you deal with that um the perceived inability of unsupervised learning to solve sort of logical not or xor like problems and then there's sort of the the thing that I think everyone is starting to look at, but combining us by time coding with unsupervised learning. And that's rather challenging. And often uh, we sort of skip to a rate coding solution or um, some sort of hybrid um, solution. So they, these are the kind of things that, that we've been looking at. So the vanishing spike problem is sort of shown in this picture here. So if we have, um, a number of layers where we've got some random spiking and then we then we have uh, the blue layer and that goes into that feeds into the orange and the green and so forth um, we either get vanishing spikes um, signal stops propagating and that's usually because we have leaky neurons and leaky neurons if the input is less than the leak. It doesn't matter if the input is going in forever, it's never gonna create a spike. Um, or we have this sort of discontinuity with spikes where if we have a input that's greater than the threshold, then we're gonna keep spiking. And so we see these cascades of bursting spikes 
um, that you know is just due to some some randomness that then gets um, amplified through the network. So we either get vanishing spikes or we get bursty behavior. Um, and this is this is a problem that lots of people, probably lots of people here have noted. Um, and it sort of stops us from looking at really deep um, spiky networks. Um, so what we want is, is something like this. And we've kind of been playing around with uh, different aspects so that we can we can get this um, sort of behavior from our networks. Um, and, and a lot of that is just looking at biology as the exemplar and the different ways that biology um, deals with sparsity and balance um, and inhibition and using those um, parts of the recipe to, to, um, to, to get the network to, to, to get out of these sort of uh, spiking, no spiking or a spiking crazy sort of discontinuities. Um, so I've already talked about the trouble with nonlinear systems. Um, and that's really the issue we're trying to get, get to an analytical solution of spiking networks. Um, and the issue is that we're up against machine learning where there's real analytical proofs on how they work. Um, whereas here we're kind of flying blind. We know that this is not what happens in biology unless something's wrong. Um, so the question is how what what are the what are the mechanisms to stop this sort of thing from happening uh, in, in in the biological context and then working backwards so that we don't get limit cycles or we get don't get vanishing um, spikes. Um, so with unsupervised learning, when do I know that I know? Um, this is uh, some hidden hidden layer neurons uh, training on MNIST. Um, I mean, it's nice because we can actually see the numbers here, but at what point is the network to learn? Um, at what point is it good enough? Um, and all, all this is, is, is completely unsupervised and it's, it's doing, um, you know, self-organization. Um, some of these uh, neurons are focusing on ones and nines. And so without sort of, you know, God looking down saying, okay, we're done. How do we know that our system is learned? Um, and how do we know that it's good enough? And these are things because we don't have an error signal that we just don't know how to deal with that. And, and do we need to deal with that? I mean, is it okay to just have a system that's constantly learning? And at some point it's, um, its performance is, is, is good enough. We kind of know with humans, we learn, we start off not great and then we get better. So maybe our networks need to just be, we need to be okay with errors, I guess. Um, and more, um, you know, instances given to the network improves its performance over time, just like we prefer, you, you know, increase our performance at, at various tasks with, with more practice. So this is just questions on how, how do you benchmark as well when you've got a system that's completely sort of free running. And any time I run this network, it could, you know, different neurons will learn different things and, you know, it's, it's completely random. There's no way to know uh, who's going to learn what and um, at what point is it, is, it, is it learned. I will say that with MNIST, um, the networks tend to not take too long to learn, so we we don't we don't we don't we just train on one epoch, and it's very very quickly that these neurons self-organize. So it is interesting watching them learn in real time because they do settle on something rather quickly, um, and perhaps some sort of measure of how a an individual um, hidden neuron is changing might be the way to learn um, when a network has finished learning. It's it's sort of a question that's still out there. Um, and I guess the other thing that goes with that is that um, the TensorFlow or the kind of standard deep learning method, this is TensorFlow, but if I if I put uh, if I kind of scan um, 
across a bunch of MNIST digits with TensorFlow, regardless of whether it's on a digit or not, it'll give you an answer. It always gives you an answer. You know, it's, it's uh, completely, you know, that's what it does. It gives answers. So even when there's no digits, it, it'll give you an answer. Um, the spiking network, though, only this is uh, sort of scanning across uh, one of our spiking networks that has um, learned MNIST. And it only, so where, where it's uh, yellow is where it's sort of given an answer. And it only gives an answer when it thinks, oh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an eight and that's a seven. So um, the differences in, in what a deep network does always given an answer and the spiking network, which because it's not trained to decrease an error, it's just learning um, learning patterns basically and self-organizing. Um, it, it only um, it only says it's seen something when it actually sees something, um, which is kind of I mean this is what we want from our networks, I think. So it's actually it's good, um, but it's different and it's a different way of judging how a network works. Um, the XOR conundrum is interesting for unsupervised learning because the way we learn using kind of a standard network with a hidden layer is we have an error signal. So without an error signal, how to learn um, these things, um, it's, uh, you know, it's something that, that obviously needs to be solved and, um, you know, we know that our brains can get it, you know, we can get our head around XOR. So, so there must be an answer for how an unsupervised network can do that as well. Um, so, so. Sarah, sorry, we are almost done with time. Oh, so you okay. have another one to five minutes. Oh, excellent. Okay. I'm nearly done. So um, I, the, the, there you go, perfect timing. Um, so yeah, so just with stuns, um, the things that are most interesting at this point, along with solving those questions about, um, uh, you know, spiking networks and the problems we have with them, it's also looking at recurrence and how do we, how do we deal with recurrence in these networks without, you know, again, going into kind of the vanishing um, spike problem or into the uh, limit cycling problem. Um, we know brain does prediction. So how do we leverage prediction out of our networks? We should be able to. Um, it should be something that we can definitely do over um, conventional machine learning. And so I think it needs to be something that you know, we, we concentrate on because it has 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 a great advantage in speed and dealing with uh, incomplete and noisy data. Um, and then adaptation. So you can leave a network on that's unsupervised um, and it will adapt. And if you're looking for anomalies, if you're looking for problems, how do you know when it, there's a problem or if something's just slowly adapted and changed? So these are all questions for dealing with um, unsupervised timed networks. Um, so what next? Um, so the Franken rhythms sort of are useful for very specific applications. Um, they're, they will continue to, to sort of gain from insight into biology. Um, and the stuns are a really great way of looking at principled understanding and solving some of the problems um, uh, that we know or issues that we know are uh, with spiking networks and, and then expanding these further to incorporate prediction and recurrence. Um, just acknowledge my um, collaborators, um, Pete Stratton and Andrew Webnitz and Ben Essam who have been working on the BitNet and the STUNS um, and Masame, uh, Shivanji, Pinzu and Gaetano have been helping me with the Franken rhythms. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks a lot, Sara. I don't know how it works here for uh, <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so for the sake of time, I will read the questions uh, because given uh, the, the word to everybody will be will take a lot of time. So I start from the most voted one, that's from Dan. Um, 
he's asking, did I understand right that you need less data for training with spiky neural networks? Do you have an intuition as to why? Why they need less data? Mm -hmm. I think it's the self-organization. So um, because a, a deep network requires the error signal to come back, um, it can make huge changes to those uh, hidden neurons. Um, whereas a spiking network is, well, an unsupervised spiking network is, is um, self-organizing right from the start. Um, so you, because you've got lateral inhibition, you're basically, every neuron is catching some of that, the features in the input. And it very quickly uh, starts to differ. Um, so I, I think it's about self-organization of, of, of hidden neurons. Okay, cool. Um, then there was another one that was uh, had some uh, votes um, that's related to this question, um, and it's from Tom. Does the data type change uh, the spiky neural network's advantage over deep neural networks in speed of learning empirically or intuitively? So, for example, maybe spiking your networks have a natural advantage in temporal anomaly detection, but not in other domains. Yeah, I think. Um, I, I think yeah, I would be cheating to say that spiking neural networks always have the advantage simply because there's a big overhead in converting data into spikes, and then working out, you know, like with the MNIST you know, you can work out a fairly easy timed code, but um, with more fine grained data, uh, you know, working out the time code for an input is, is, is quite a big overhead. But once it's in spikes, I think you're always going to get the advantage of, of the self-organization and the speed. Um, as, as, long as, um, as long as you've got a good code, for your data um, that's in a sort of spike time form, then I think it will always have the speed advantage. Okay, uh, so a question from Finn uh, that is actually on DeepNet. So it's asking, what, what is this network? Uh, so you presented the results, I think one of the last yeah. slides. Yeah, so uh, BitNet is uh, this one here. Yeah, so BitNet is is the name we give to our spiking network. Um, it's it's our kind of little pet name for it. Um, and and basically, it's it's a network that's uh, what do we call it, BitNet? Um, it's like it, we use binned timing, so that that's where the BI comes from. So it's it's uh, yeah. So if you've ever seen the SORN network, the recurrent network, it's sort of a feed forward version of that. Um, but yeah, BitNet is basically our stun. So it's it's a spike timing unsupervised neural network. Okay. Um, then um, how did you train on Moby Dick? Did you do next factor prediction? So I think this was from uh, Freedom. And uh, sorry, how did I how did you train on Moby Dick? Did you do next character prediction? And uh, oh, please just yes, asking related yes. to that, please explain what is being learned. And could you also explain what the anomaly is in that case from Gorby? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so let me go back there. Um, I always put too much in these things. So, uh, yeah, so we trained it from, you know, call me Ishmael, straight through um and so an anomaly was when we got a wrong character come next so if we put in a, sort of a bunch of text and then we ask the network what comes next um if it gave something that wasn't um really in the text then it's it's an anomaly so, so these this measure looks at how good it was at picking those up. So, um, if it was, um, you know, if it was good at finishing off the next word, the next few characters, um, 
then it's it's sort of doing well at audio encoding but if it's um if it's giving us the wrong um letter then um yeah, wrong character then we it's it's a it's an anomaly Okay, so th there are really lots of questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess this is an indication that the talk was really well received and, and interesting. So uh, someone, let me check the name, Alexander. He's asking, should we, should we be focusing on one or few shot learning where most of the learning happens in a unsupervised way through self-organization? And we intervened right at the end to stick labels on behaviors and categories that have emerged as a result. So kind of the yeah. you were talking about <laughs> before. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question because we grappled with this ourselves, right? So we we end up with um, we end up with you know hidden neurons that do this, and then how do we know that it learned anything? <laughs> you know, so that, so then you read the like for us the way we train, you know, like the way we worked out whether this was working or not is using a linear decoder. Um, and then we then we came up with the spike forcing. So we had like uh, populations of neurons that responded to uh, different um, uh, digits, and whichever population was more active told us that that was most likely the the, the, um, the digit. Um, but actually, it's a really hard thing. You either use some sort of decoder at the output, which is obvious. Supervised, or you, um, or or the 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 spike forcing which we used, um, which we now started to use, is actually really good at also giving us, you know, in MNIST, there's some digits that look, you know, that humans get wrong, um, and the network sort of behaves similarly. It's like, oh, that could be a six or it could be a zero, and you sort of see the the neurons. Um, for those uh, digits, sort of both both those populations spiking a bit. So, um, but it, it is actually really hard to know how to do that. So, th so the idea of sort of doing a very fast unsupervised learning and then supervising at the end is actually a really good way to get a very quick um, network trained and uh, and verified. Yes, I mean, if I may add one one question from my side related to this. Um, to me, it's not clear um, what an anomaly would be in this case. Would it be something that the, the latter has not seen before and will be a new category, a new digit? Or um, because you don't yes. know how many there are, right? We know now that we have 10, but it could be that we are in an hexadecimal domain and we have more uh, symbols that we never encountered before. Is that you know, an anomaly, misclassification, or something new. Um, how can you understand that? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, um, I guess here the network doesn't respond at all to things that, um, like, it's not responding. So you can imagine we've got a little window that's sort of centered, like, like an MNIST thing, and we're just like tripping between, like, scanning like one pixel at a time across. Um, so if if the network hasn't seen it before, it it doesn't it doesn't spike. There's no um, there's no output. So you could say the lack of a response from Bitnet in this case is indicative of an anomaly um, because it it it's it's not a zero to nine. It, it hasn't been trained on. Um, it hasn't been trained on. It hasn't seen it before. And I, actually, that's the power of this because a kind of straight artificial network will always guess, will always give you something. That's interesting. These are actually very interesting problems to look into. Yeah, the, no, it's, it's, yeah, look, it, it's down the rabbit hole. But I mean, it is actually lots of fun. So, you know, everyone get on board the uh, unsupervised uh, training. <laughs> Okay, so just to, to keep the time, I think we have to stop with the questions. There are other questions in the in the question list. If you want maybe to have a look and answer in the chat, uh, this could be a way or 
I, I don't know yep. how it could be organized. Uh, but I think we have to move to the next speaker. So thanks okay, again, Sarah. No, thank nice. you, everyone. It's been fun. Yeah.